so uh, it's been a while, but I took my meds, so here I am making a video for once. Um, yeah, I have a lot of footage to edit, but anyways, now I have a microphone, which I'm using right now, and um, also a camcorder, so I have better workflow when recording, because recording using a phone is annoying to deal with file transferring. Um, now, uh, note about the microphone, this is a different microphone. I built this one, you can see it on screen right now, it's cursed, but it works very well. The one I was using to record this video originally, also this is my first testing of the um, camcorder really, um, the, the microphone I had originally for this video was a wireless lavalier microphone. The issue is it, it had noise suppression that you could not disable. It did not like the fume hood sound, so my voice was horrible. Um, also some parts just died. Um, so I'm going to be narrating over this video pretty much. is purine hydrochloride, which chem player use. You just simply fuse it, and it works. But the yield is horrible. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to do that. I did originally intend to do research on it and see if I could probably use like purine hydrobromide instead. But honestly, um, using p just purine alone is not very good. So I found this procedure on Arrowhead, of course. Um, Arrowhead. Uh, but anyways, it claims you can get a quantitative yield basically, uh, if you just use nitrobenzene, aluminum bromide, and uh, the issue is this procedure does not work. So if you want a working procedure, this is not the thing to use. It does not work as described. It could work under different conditions, but I have not tested under different conditions. I just followed it exactly, which don't work. So, hooray. Warning. Nitrobenzene is toxic and possesses a unique property for epidermal absorption, so gloves must be employed when handling nitrobenzene in its pyramidal state. The gloves should also be checked for contamination frequently and changed for a new pair if contamination is present, as nitrobenzene is able to permeate through nitrile and latex over rapidly. Dual gloves are far more preferable, however they are more costly and generally thicker, meaning that they are a bit difficult to work in. This is for the science, it's actually not worth making this stuff, it's a lot better to just buy whatever the product is, or you know, whatever. Now, 
it's a good time to note that the reflex condenser should be very efficient. Uh, my condenser is being cooled with um, negative 10 Celsius and the my call to make sure nothing escaped. And uh, we'll just let the broom add in the heat. At the end, you just dump most of it in because there's not really much happening. And uh, it would be ideal if you bring this to a reflex until all the brooming goes away, but I was impatient, so I didn't do that. I just kind of let it stir for a while. see a bit of HBR fuming because the aluminum bromide is a bit volatile at room temperature. And I'll just remove the DCM by evaporating it and um, you'll see there's some remaining bromine so that's why I say it might be good to reflux the mixture for a bit later. But uh, yeah, you can see here it uh, does not look so good. It should be white powder and uh, this is why I think DCM is not the best solvent. It probably reacted. I would not be surprised if a halogen exchange happened so maybe I got some dibromoethane, um, dibromomethane and, um, aluminum chloride, but whatever. So now we'll add approximately 10 milliliters of nitrobenzene, and surprisingly it dissolves. I did not expect that to happen, um, but I assume it's forming a complex of sorts. So now we have this solution of tar, and uh, that will be placed into the addition funnel once again. And you can see bits of leftover that really should not matter. Anyways, we'll add 2.25 grams of valin into 10 milliliters of nitrobenzene and let it dissolve by just stirring it, of course, obviously. Now there's a bit of leftover magnesium sulfate and nitrobenzene, but I don't think that actually matters too much. Uh, but um, this run did fail, so I really don't know. Um, and uh, we'll add the aluminum bromide nitrobenzene solution to this very slowly, and I'll also place on an air-cooled condenser. And this is the part where the procedure is kind of vague on what to do. I don't like vague procedures. I like to know what on earth I'm doing. Uh, but anyways, we'll just add the nitrobenzene and it's supposed- well, the nitrobenzene aluminum bromide solution, and it's supposed to form a gelatinous material, um, which is the supposed reaction complex, um, which, uh, you know, the reaction's working if it does that, and you will see it indeed does slowly become gelatinous. Um, now this makes stirring very difficult, though, and it looks horrible, uh, but anyways, I added all of the, um, solution in, and you can see it thickened up significantly until it no longer stirred properly. Now, it also says you dilute it, so I added in the rest of the nitrobenzene, about 14 milliliters, and uh, during the addition, the um, uh, gelatin mixture, kind of, did get warm, so it was doing something. Now, here's the part where I'm a bit dubious on this reaction. It is um, that gelatinous material looks suspiciously like aluminum hydroxide or at least in my opinion anyways. Now, it should not be aluminum hydroxide because my solvent was dry and the aluminum bromide was also dry, but whatever. And now is the part where it says heat to 95 and then cool to room temperature. It, it yeah, I, it, how long, uh, how fast, it does not tell you. Um, now you could say, oh, it's just Arrowhead being bad. No, I dug up the original literature. It's just bad, it's horribly vague. You can see right here, it just says, you just add the aluminum bromide to it, you heat it, and then you cool it. So, what am I supposed to do? Do I heat it to 95 for, and hold it there for a few minutes? Do I heat it and then immediately cool it? It does not tell you. Um, so I think this is the part where it made the reaction not work. I suspect you probably have to reflux it for a bit more. but. Let's take a look at what's happening here. So it's just a standard Lewis acid catalyzed demethylation, basically, an ether cleavage. Um, now, usually um, you would use something like boron tribromide, but we're using aluminum bromide here. And you can see in the um, mechanism I came up with, the nitrobenzene just kind of there. I'm pretty sure it forms a complex, but I don't know the structure of it, so I just didn't draw it. Um, but anyways, we will add water to this after it's been stirred for half an hour at room temperature after being heated to 95 Celsius, whatever that means. So now I will try my best to 
break this material up and add it into water, and we will acidify it with some hydrochloric acid to dissolve any aluminum hydroxide and such, because it's being hydrolyzed in water. And uh, here I got a little stirring going. Now, um, the particulate matter never fully dissolved, so I don't know what's wrong with it, uh, but it was very acidic from pH paper, so I really do not know. And I accidentally broke my crystallizing dish in the sink, so that's great. Uh, glassware keeps breaking. But anyways, I just let this stir for a while, because I want to see if it dissolves or not, but it didn't, so we will just proceed with this. And uh, we have an aqueous layer on top and the organic layer on the bottom, because nitrobenzene is denser than water. So we will just extract the aqueous layer with diethyl ether a few times, and um, that should bring any product dissolved in the water layer into our organics layer. And um, I used about 30 milliliters of ether times 3. Uh, this is the part where I deviate from the procedure a little bit because it did not seem to be very good in my opinion, so yeah. Um, but anyways, we just extracted a couple times and you can see the particulate stuff in there also gets pulled out, which is kind of annoying, but okay. And you can see on the second extraction the ether was already clear, so there probably wasn't much left over to extract, but I just continued anyways, so yay. And uh, now I pull the um, organics together, so it's now it's a mixture of nitrobenzene and diethyl ether and our product, and we'll wash it with sodium hydroxide solution, because um, this will turn our well, product, hopefully, into a sodium salt, which dissolves into the aqueous layer instead of the organic layer, therefore omitting vanillin. Though, ideally, you would titrate this to a very specific pH based on the pKa and volume of solution, but I didn't, I just threw in a random amount of sodium hydroxide, which probably deprotonate the vanillin too. Um, you'll see why later on. But if you do this correctly, it should simply omit vanillin. Now, um, apparently you can also use DCM to extract vanillin out. I did not try it on this run, but on a successful different procedure, I used DCM and that seemed to have separated the vanillin out quite effectively. Now the weird thing about this um, leftover aqueous solution was it was kind of pH indicating because of the um, deprotonation and protonation of the salt, but uh, on acidification with sulfuric acid you can see it went yellow, and uh, now I have to get it cool otherwise it will just boil the ether when I try to extract it again. So now our product should be in its free acid form, or the free phenol form basically. So you can see the ether becomes yellow, and that is our product, hopefully, alongside some junk being extracted too. And I extracted it with ether once again three times, with just a random amount really. So I'm going to go ahead and dry that with some uh, calcium chloride, not the best, but it's what I had on hand, and I'll go ahead and remove the diethyl ether by a uh, rotary evaporation. So here's a quick summary of what we just did, basically. It's um, a very nice way of doing an acid-base extraction, where you bring it back into the aqueous and back out the aqueous a few times, and that omits other stuff that does not form salt. Um, so yeah, um, this theoretically should have omitted the vanillin, but it didn't. Probably because of, again, the fact that I just threw random amounts of sodium hydroxide in and I didn't really titrate it carefully until neutral. Um, but anyways, we will continue. So I'm going to save these for now, just in case, um, because you never know if your product actually got extracted or not. So to the whiteboard now, we will see uh, on the left is valin and on the right is protochitruic aldehyde, our product. Ignore the number underneath it for now. And um, obviously the main difference is our product is um, two hydroxyl groups on it, so it's more polar. That means we can identify our product by TLC, and uh, that'll sh show us if we have our product and about, you know, an estimated amount of um, conversion. And um, the number underneath is just the approximate RF value um, calculated based off a chart. Now, the first concerning thing is um, it should not be a liquid. Temperature? It looks weird. 
I, that, that's not a good sign. I'm gonna write that down. Here, here's our track of, um, it looks weird. Uh, it should not be molten at room temperature. So, it also smells like vanillin. This is some foreshadowing. But anyways, we'll run a TLC on it. This is the first TLC of the channel, I think. Now, I'll go ahead and pour out some of this mystery liquid, which should be product, hopefully. And, uh, it, um, it's behaving a bit weirdly. It seems to be solidifying slowly. Interesting. So, maybe it's not Valen. Valen has a melting point of, like, 40 or 80. I don't remember, but it's low. And uh, this is just solidified, so I guess it just oiled out, maybe? It did not oil out. But anyways, I'll go ahead and dissolve that in some acetone as a solvent. And um, also prepare some vanillin dissolved in acetone as a reference sample. It would be ideal if I had some known particular aldehyde as another reference sample, but this two sample TLC will be fine, and because this is for a video, I don't really care about the quality of the TLC plate, uh, so it's a bit messed up, but whatever. And uh, on the left we will have our quote-unquote product, and on the right we will have our reference vanillin. So go ahead and spot these two, and uh, I will spot them a bit larger than you should for a TLC for the sake of video, so you can actually see it. So there is our supposed product, and also vanillin. Now, I'll TLC this in just pure diethyl ether, and uh, you can see... Hmm. Now, the topmost spot is probably vanillin, because it's less polar, so it's less attractive to the silica, and the bottom one it should be our product, but there's not much. So let's do a melting point test. Uh, we'll just boil it in water, because our product should not melt in hot water, and it melted in hot water. So, we just have dirty vanillin. Uh, not all chemistry is a success. I guess this will have to wait until another rainy day. But, well, that's it really for this video. And I'd like to thank the following people. Um, David Fetter, Sodium Hydroxide, Saffron, Tiki Tack, William Ackerson, and $5 a month, Amanita Okreda, Cody Mize, Mies, I don't know, sorry, and JH for supporting me financially on Patreon, which I have to file taxes because they are not giving me my money. Anyways, I also have a Discord server where I'm very active, so um, they also have, if you want to check that out, check that out. I guess there's a lot of people who are way smarter than me, and that's it for this video. See y'all next time.